to know one another, get to develop friendships, a level of trust com comes about that helps us bridge over disagreements and, and animosities that may arise from time to time. And we've done this a lot, not just in terms of legislation, but uh, many consensus statements bringing together a, an array of different uh, points of view uh, to find uh, common ground on religion in the public schools, uh, religious expression uh, in public places, uh, and faith-based partnerships between government and, and uh, religious bodies. And I do think that we are making some progress on how we negotiate the uh, variegated texture of our religious landscape in this country. And it's reflected in our, in our body politic. We have two Muslims in the United States Congress. We have a Buddhist in the Senate and a Hindu in the House of Representatives. The United States Supreme Court, for the first time in 225 years, has no Protestant serving on the court. Did you know that? Hmm. Six Catholics and three Jewish justices. The two political parties in the 2012 presidential election, for the first time in history, had no white Anglo-Saxon Protestant on either ticket. An African-American member of the United Church of Christ, two Catholics, and a Mormon. I'm not saying that this is sufficient pro uh, progress, but it's at least a promising start, I think. Yes, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are rampant in places. Yes, about 50% of the American public thinks that the United States is a Christian nation, legally and constitutionally, not just sociologically and demographically, but legally and constitutionally, and of course they are absolutely wrong. And although a week ago we might have said that we were making some progress on race, we were starkly reminded of how much we have left to do when Donald Sterling made clear that racism still infects our lives together. And the tragic killing that's already been mentioned in, in Kansas shows us the, the ugly head of virulent anti-Semitism. So yes, we still have a lot to do, but I am optimistic. I, I choose to think that the glass is half full and look forward to working to fill up the other half. And I have high hopes for this symposium's future in leading that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> Sheikh Yasser Khadi. Thank you, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, and I'm gonna center my talk around three points about my own experiences with interfaith. Um, the first point, or the first, if you like, maxim that I um, have for this talk, groups that most need interfaith dialogue are typically the least involved in such efforts. <laughs> groups that most need interfaith dialogue are typically the least involved in such efforts. In other words, what ends up happening uh, in interfaith dialogue typically is that like-minded individuals from different faiths with similar views on religious freedom, similar views on religious tolerance, come together and talk, and they're pleasantly surprised and amazed at how similar their views are on religious freedom and tolerance. <laughs> In the meantime, churches, mosques, and synagogues where uncomfortable rhetoric, negative stereotypes, and perhaps even hate speech is being propagated are loudly absent from such interfaith dinners and dialogues. Now, I've been in Memphis, Tennessee for the last four years. I was raised in Texas. I did my PhD from the other institute. <laughs> um, so I've been in Memphis. <laughs> I had to, I had to do something. What's your loyalty? Skip. Yeah. <laughs> there are three aliens up here. <laughs> uh, and uh, our mosque in Memphis has been involved with a lot of interfaith work. Presbyterians, Catholics, Lutherans, the Reform Synagogue. But remember, this is Tennessee here. And Muslims in Tennessee don't have problems with their Episcopalian neighbors. Mm. The largest demographics, I'm not gonna mention it here, but the largest demographics, the community from which quite a lot of uncomfortable rhetoric and sentiments have been heard is simply not involved in our interfaith activities. Mm -hmm. And there's so much negative sentiment about the other that many of that demographics actually feels that merely participating in such events 
waters down their own understanding of religion and legitimizes the existence of the other. And I don't mean to pinpoint any one religion here. There are five mosques in Memphis, and not coincidentally, the mosques that are most involved in interfaith are also the most tolerant and the most open-minded mosques. Now, unfortunately, that's the maxim that I have, but I don't have a solution yet for this problem. But here is where I do believe that civic leaders elected officials, they can play a very important role and act as conduits between these various demographics. We have reached out to the largest churches in Memphis. As of yet, they have ignored us. However, if the mayor had reached out to the both of us, if a local congressman, if the state senator were to facilitate an interfaith dialogue, were to facilitate an interfaith dinner, it will be far more difficult to say no to such a civic leader. The second of the three points, Acknowledging the elephant or the elephants in the room makes the room easier to navigate. Now typically, many interfaith projects attempt to stress the commonality of our faith traditions, love of God, love of neighbor, doing good unto others, etc. And of course, that is great. But at some point in time, we do need to move beyond the, uh, the positive platitudes, if you like, and do concentrate on the very real differences. Let's be honest with ourselves and honest with each other. In some ways, each one of us that is a part of a religious tradition believes in the exceptionalism of our own faith tradition, or else we would not be a part of those faith traditions. There are very uncomfortable questions that are lurking in the background. If not in my mind and our minds as educated clergy, definitely in the minds of our constituents, in the minds of those who come to our mosques and churches and synagogues. And let me give you another example that took place uh, recently in Memphis, uh, the last Thanksgiving. For the first time, there was a massive interfaith Thanksgiving uh, dinner at the Reform Temple, the Reform Synagogue in Memphis. 15 different clergymen and clergywomen were invited. For the first time, a Muslim, myself, was invited as well. So one after the other, imagine 15 sermons, one after the other, I had to, <laughs> I had to sit there. So one of the pastors walked up and in a very difficult lecture, he ended up on the note of, I wouldn't be doing justice to you and to what I believe in, and to my love for you, if I didn't tell you that unless you believe in the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And because I love you all, I have to tell you this. Now, it was very awkward, and I could literally see, I could literally see a huge weight off of his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Next morning, I received a call from the senior rabbi of the synagogue, the, the, the one who had invited me, apologizing if I had felt uncomfortable uh, for, uh, for what had happened, and he said he had received complaints and whatnot. By the way, there's gotta be a joke in there. The rabbi calls the imam to apologize for the pastor. <laughs> but anyway, so I told him, I told him I wasn't offended in the slightest. And in fact, after that sermon, the pastor was far more friendly with me and engaged in a nice and fruitful conversation. In other words, after he's told me that he thinks I'm going to hell, he can actually have a conversation you know, on a more fruitful topic. So my, my point here with the second maxim That's is, great. We really do need to let these elephants out and, and, and just get it off of our chest and then perhaps move on to something more fruitful. The final point, as we emphasize interfaith dialogue, let us not forget intra-faith dialogue and also dialogue with those of no faith. Sometimes it's more awkward to engage with intra-faith than with interfaith. Mm -hmm. At least with interfaith, the other is truly an other. But with intra-faith, what happens when the vernacular is shared yet different? The rituals are similar yet dissimilar. Mm -hmm. That is when true awkwardness sets in. And again, we had an issue in Memphis between the Sunni and the Shiite uh, mosque because of a cemetery issue. It was far more awkward for me to navigate through that dispute than it was to be at any interfaith dinner. So <laughs> let's not forget about the intra Faith and also, as we said, with those with no faith, especially uh, in light of the fact that Pew, uh, a Pew survey last year said that 30% of Americans above the age of 30 do not identify with a religion. 30%. That's one out of three, obviously, around. And that's a statistic that is uh, very interesting, to say the least. Let me conclude on a lighter note. There is simply no denying that modernity has forced all of us not only to get along, but to change and modify our vernacular, our traditions, and even our sermons. We're all preaching the same message now. Every single denomination of every single Abrahamic tradition in every single mosque and church and synagogue across this great land begins its services with the same holy invocation. Please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, sir. And the, That's very familiar. Another yeah. <laughs> uh, 
another Yaley, I have to say, and a member of Skull and Bones. Oh, God, I can't believe you just said that. Skull and Bones, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Rabbi Angela W. Bukdal, oh, please. Thank you. Thank you. So I appreciated so much the invitation to be here. And, um, and you heard a little bit of my background. I wanted to give you a little bit of my credentialing in terms of interfaith work, though. Um, from a personal perspective, I was born in South Korea, and I have a Buddhist mother and a Jewish American father. And we moved to the United States, and my mother helped bring three of her sisters to Tacoma, Washington. And each one of them converted to, to Christianity when they came. One of them became a uh, minister and started a very um, large and robust uh, Korean Christian church in my in my town, and so um, I felt like I am, I was the interfaith experience, and I and I felt like becoming a religious studies major in college was a sort of form of therapy, and I felt like it <laughs> it was um, uh, navigating that and the intersections between culture and religion was always something that I was navigating in my in my own life. Um, this, just this week, um, the Jewish community observed Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Memorial Day. And um, we have, the, I think, the longest running interfaith Yom HaShoah commemoration with Central Synagogue and St. Peter's Lutheran Church, which is across the street. This is our 27th year, I believe, that we've been doing a commemoration together. We had our choirs singing together. And we had our speaker was a congregant from Central Synagogue who is the new director of the 9-11 Memorial um, Museum, which is going to open in about 16 days. And she shared, um, having worked both at the Washington, D.C. Holocaust Memorial and um, now at the 9-11 Museum, she talked about the importance for each um, religious tradition and people of just civic minds to come forward and speak out against hatred in, in, in houses of worship, but also across, across the nation. And so it was very powerful from that perspective just to remind ourselves that we weren't alone in remembering um, the Holocaust. I'm also on the board of um, Auburn Theological Seminary, which is a Presbyterian seminary that is almost 200 years old. And yet, I'm a, what's a rabbi doing on the board of a Presbyterian seminary? It's because of the interfaith work they do and the way that they speak out for people from all religions. And an example was when there was the shooting in the Gudwara in, in Wisconsin, the Sikh um, house of worship. Uh, that Auburn was the first um, organization that came that was not a, a non-Sikh organization that came and spoke, and then cooperated with people um, in political spheres to, for the first time to have um, the Sikhs rep represented under hate crimes. Um, they were not really recognized as their own religious tradition under hate crimes. They were lumped in with Muslims, which is uh, its own form of ignorance, that they were, they're completely different. And yet, um, they didn't distinguish. And so for the first time, that also was done. So in some ways, um, my, my work, my passion has been to be involved in interfaith work um, throughout. I, each one of us comes to this question from a different place, but I'd like to share, um, I guess I, in some ways I come from a defensive place, because I read the question when Skip sent it to me, that in some ways, what is the role of faith communities in this kind of work, in religious tolerance and freedom, in the work of creating, I would say, you know, the vision of the world that God wants on this earth without, with, where abundance is shared and where, um, uh, where we are able to eradicate the racism and the violence that is in our world. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's interesting that Sheikh um, Yasser Qadi just brought up the fact that, you know, among the young population, 30% are not um, aff affiliated with a religion. We are becoming less religious as a, a, a the fastest growing um, religious group in America are the nuns. And I don't mean the N-U-Ns, I mean the N-O-N-E-S's. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the, the fact that just the case for what role do faith communities have anymore in, or what should be the role um, that faith communities have in, in promoting not just religious freedom, but the, the civil rights and the respect and the dignity and the responsibility that was spoken of. I'd like to just share three thoughts on why I think faith communities in particular have um, a fundamental role to play. One, I think that faith communities, we take the long view. Um, we, we have timeless traditions, ancient wisdom, and there is a sense that when we, um, that we will take, we'll stay the course beyond a particular election cycle or one particular leader's role. So I think the fact that we are rooted in long and deep traditions and recognize that 
that we will we are connected to something that has come from way before us and will and will endure long after us helps us kind of stay the course in a way that I think is particular in, for for faith traditions with those kinds of wisdom traditions as well. The second is I, I have a fundamentally optimistic view of human nature, and I think that most people really want to do good in the world. I, I really believe that. I think that we ultimately, we want to love our neighbor. We want to get rid of evil. We want to act in, in decent ways to, our, um, to, to other people. But I think that sometimes we lose sight of that, and we need the reminders that ritualized um, both religion and worship and holidays and all those kinds of remembrance can, can offer people. So I think the role that religion can play is still incredibly fundamental. Um, I think about the fact that recently in the Jewish community we celebrate our Passover Seder and the mandate is not just to tell the story of our ancestors, but the mandate is to actually know what it is to be a slave. And if you actually live that out and taste the bitterness of slavery and know what it is to be a stranger, then there's no way you can operate in the world in the same way if you've actually experienced what it is to be. And we try to get as close to that as we can without having experienced it. But our tradition mandates that we feel that. And if we do, then we have to walk in the world differently. So I would say that religion at its best allows people to understand what it is to be in those positions in the, in the narrow places of, of the world, to be the stranger and then to behave in the world differently because of that. And the actual ritual of going through the, mo the motions, tasting, touching, feeling it, um, I think makes the stickiness of that, makes those values that we aspire to become real in our lives in a different way. And the last thing I just say is that we know that organized people equals power. And um, I, I think that many people, I'm gonna guess if I were to ask how many of you belong to you know, a civil liberties union or a gay rights advocacy group or um, a, you know, the ADL or some organization that, where we believe in their values, I'm gonna guess that many of you are members of some of these wonderful organizations that do this kind of work. But for me, um, many of those organizations, membership entails um, maybe attending a lecture once, paying a membership due, and maybe getting a newsletter. So the question is, where is um, where's the relationship? Because I think actual social change is going to happen when there are inherent relationships built in within people. And faith communities are centers of relationship. And when you organize faith communities for the, for the larger good, um, I think incredible things can happen. I'll offer one example. Um, I'm part of what's called Manhattan Together, which is my local um, industrial areas foundation chapter, which is a community organizing chapter. And um, we have been involved with issues around gun control and we're part of a national movement. Uh, the, our, our sister chapter in California decided to organize around gun control and they got 200 rabbis in California to preach over the high holidays on gun control. And then, um, then they said, Let's, there's a bill in Congress and we are going to flood the, the phone lines, and they did. And they were able to organize in a way, not just because they had a few leaders with members who check off a box, but literally um, mobilizing between hundreds of rabbis, hundreds of thousands of people who had a real relationship with each other and were able to mobilize in a different way because of that power. So I would say faith communities organize people which creates organized power that allows us to make a kind of change that I think um, uh, organization, other organizations can't always have. So I'd say that, um, end with one line from the ethics of our fathers, Pirkei Avot, which um, I'll interpret in my translation, sort of say, the, the day is short and the work is long, but God is knocking at the door. And it's not our job to complete the entire task, but yet we can't desist from continuing to work at it. Beautiful, thank you, Rabbi. Good, now we're gonna do a round of um, two questions, and then um, we'll open it up for a question and answer from the floor, okay? And we're gonna start with Rabbi Buchdahl. Um, I had the privilege of doing your fascinating genealogy in which we made discoveries in both the Jewish and Korean sides of your heritage. Remarkable discoveries on the Korean side, particularly. Um, can you talk about how your upbringing in two cultures shaped your ideas about American identity? And how important is religious freedom to your American identity? And did you take flack ever uh, from the K Korean friends inside of your family for not being Korean enough and take flack 
from the Jewish side of your family or Jewish believers for not being Jewish enough? Hmm. <laughs> so I have to thank um, Professor Gates because because of him, I learned that I was um, the 19th direct descendant of three different, I mean, the 18th, 19th, and 20th great-grandfathers of mine were kings of Korea. Right. So I got to find out that I was truly a Jewish Korean princess, which was uh, <laughs> really awesome. The only one in the world. <laughs> That might be true. Um, <laughs> one of the revelations I learned about one of my ancestors, though, which was quite fascinating, was that my 19th great-grandfather, King Sejong, who was considered the greatest king in Korean history. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's that's um, not subjective. He um, created the Korean alphabet called Hangul, which is a phonetic, very simple phonetic alphabet. And uh, what was fascinating about that is learning that he created that because he really understood that knowledge was power. That his people really, before that, Koreans only, um, the very most educated elite class could read because they read Chinese characters. And at that time, you needed to learn 50,000 characters to be a literate um, person. And so he created this very simple alphabet so that people could um, have access to books and to knowledge and understanding. Um, Unfortunately, his kind of noble class refused to teach this language. So for 500 years, they had an alphabet that you could learn in about two hours, and people didn't learn it until after the war. Um, and, and then, of course, it actually skyrocketed Korea's um, uh, economy when people became literate. But I say that because I think fundamental to um, the way I think of myself as an American and, and a Korean and a Jew um, is that, that it's foundational to have access to knowledge and uh, I, th I think that I'm in mean, an institution, a tremendous institution of higher learning. And I think the fact that we, um, it's one of the things that makes me most proud about being an American and a Jew and a Korean, the, the, the valuing of knowledge and, and our ability to create the access for that knowledge is so key. Um, I grew up um, kind of feeling always a little bit mixed up. And, uh, and when I first came to the United States, I remember feeling that everyone asked me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Korea. And then when I went back to Korea, when I was just a little bit older, I, they said, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from Korea. And they said, no, you're not. <laughs> and I remember feeling like, does this mean I don't fit anywhere? And I, but my mother said, no, you're an American. And everyone from America is from somewhere. <laughs> and we don't, we don't want to forget that. We are, none of us is that removed from um, an immigrant story. And perhaps it's our own family or, or someone that we're very close to. So it is, um, I, I would say that, um, in the Jewish community, it's not that my family gave me flack, but I, I can't tell you how many times people said to me, that's funny, you don't look Jewish, uh, which I didn't think was all that funny, but, uh, but it's, uh, I understand that. And on the Korean side, I would say that um, I never fully felt like I fit in because my entire Korean community that I related to in Tacoma, Washington, was very affiliated with the Korean church. And, and Koreans, um, many American Koreans are very connected to their church. And even when I got to Yale, I went to visit the Korean Student Association at Yale. My roommate was also Korean, and we went there together. And I remember that they, we had this meeting, and at the end of the meeting, they said, okay, and now we're all going to um, go to church as our next meeting. And I remember thinking, wow, I guess I can't fit in here. So um, I do struggle with the sense of what is our cultural identity and our religious identity, and what happens, can you be 100% um, Korean or 100% Jewish and meld these? these um, and I guess, I guess part of what I've learned is that uh, all of these identities, that almost everyone in the world they're negotiating multiple identities. Um, it might be that you're um, black and gay, or um, you know, a feminist and an Orthodox Jew. Mm -hmm. Many of us are negotiating multiple identities. So in some ways, I wear on my face what, what I think every American is um, struggling with. And I think, actually, it enhances us very much that we can. And do you think those experiences made you so defiantly tolerant? Defiantly? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a mandate yeah, for us. I, I agree. Um, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Mm -hmm. I also had the privilege of, of tracing the Sheikh's family tree, and it gave us the opportunity to speak in depth about what you've seen as an evolution in the presence of Islam in this country, uh, and of course, 9-11's impact on that. Can you speak to us this afternoon about the transformations wrought by 9-11 on the growing population of Muslims in this country? Absolutely. For Muslims, 9-11 was really like a double tragedy. 
Uh, firstly, it was a tragedy because obviously as Americans, as fellow Americans, we mourned the same loss, uh, loss of life and um, loss of honor, loss of dignity. There were at least at least 75 Muslims who died uh, in the Twin Towers. Uh, and uh, that's Which nobody uh, ever talks about. Nobody ever talks about that. We, we actually did that in our, in our uh, PBS documentary. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's a neglected uh, number of 75 Muslims that were working in the Twin Towers when they came down. And then obviously the backlash that resulted, the Islamophobia, the draconian laws. Um, uh, what happened because of that was that the American Muslim community was galvanized like no other event. And mm -hmm. immigrant Muslims, because by and large, American uh, Muslims are comprised of two uh, segments or, or sectors. The first is immigrant Muslims who have immigrated the last 40 years, 50 years, and the second is African American converts. Now, mm -hmm. uh, what 9 11 did was number one, build bridges between the African American convert Muslims and generally their inner city Muslims, and then the suburban immigrant middle to upper class Muslims, which by and large was not connected with the uh, inner city African American uh, movements of Islam. 9 11 made the two communities realize that we need each other. and. Each community has resources the other does not have. And so 9-11 for the very first time brought about this type of building bridges between these two very different demographics of American Islam. Additionally, immigrant Muslims in particular were galvanized to start becoming engaged, uh, engaged in civic and in political action. By and large, most immigrant Muslims were very apolitical. They hardly voted. They simply minded their own business and went about you know, earning their money and living the American dream. Well, obviously, after 9-11, so many different laws were put into place, immigrant, immigrant violations, um, uh, draconian terror laws, and, and Sharia bills were trying to be passed in many states banning the practice of Islam. Islam was demonized in the media. And for the very first time, Muslims realized we need our voice in the media. We need our voice in politics. We need our voice everywhere else people's voices are represented. Why should somebody else speak for us on the table? We need to be there ourselves. And so... For the, and I remember growing up in the 70s in Texas, we never talked about voting in the mosque. We never talked about getting involved in the you know, civic affairs of the sea. We never talked, this is just not a part of our vernacular because our forefathers, I mean, I'm a first or second generation American. My father came to America in 1963 and most American Muslims of my heritage are similar. Their fathers came, not their great, great, great grandfathers. Generally speaking, we were born here, our parents came here. So our parents coming here meant they didn't really view themselves as being fully integrated into America. Mm -hmm. The problems are the problems back home. But that's not 